aspects of, uh, of corporation law. We want to look at the question from July 97. And the problem with the question from July 97 is that I need my glasses to read them. Put them somewhere. question reads as follows. Artist, a respected computer engineer, invented a unique computer device, but she lacked sufficient financial resources to manufacture and market it. Artist presented to Ben, a wealthy acquaintance, a business plan for producing and selling the device. Ben and Artist agreed that, one, Artist would form a corporation named Comco to manufacture uh, the device. Two, Ben would provide the financing by contracting with corporation to loan it one million dollars. So it's interesting, Ben is going to loan the corporation one million. He's not buying stock, he's loaning it one million dollars. And three, Ben would receive periodic loan payments a number of shares of the corporation equal to the number that would be issued to artists. Okay? So Ben is going to get some stock, but he's getting stock from loaning money as opposed to investing money. Uh, and then also gets a 20% of the net profits for the first 10 years. So this guy, Ben, is driving a hard bargain. He's loaning $1 million to the corporation. In exchange for this loan, he is getting the loan repaid and getting the same amount of stock that Artis is getting and 20% of the profits for the first 10 years. Now that seems pretty steep. It seems like Ben's getting an awful lot for his million dollars. He's getting, in principle, the million paid back. He's getting 20% of the profits. And he's getting the same amount of stock that artists are getting. Stock, repayment, and profits. Now that seems a lot. But not that outrageous because uh, Ben may never get his million dollars back. Something may go wrong with the device, with the marketing and selling of the device. So Ben may never get his million dollars back. So he's taking a substantial risk. Also, please notice that when Ben gets the million dollars back, he's not charging any interest on the million dollars. So you loan somebody a million dollars and you do not charge them interest, then Ben might be entitled to some compensation for not charging interest. And that compensation seems to be not only as much stock as artists are getting, but also 20% of the profit. for the next 10 years. 
Artists called the article the incorporation to be prepared. That's fine, that's what artists are supposed to do. For the corporation as a closed corporation. Well, that's reasonable. It's a closed corporation, there are only a few people involved. Right now, it's only artists and Ben involved. She also caused to be prepared a loan agreement in which Ben and Comco were the parties. A loan agreement in which Ben and Comco are the parties. Well, that's what she was supposed to do. The trouble is, yeah, that's what she was supposed to do. She prepared the loan agreement. The agreement contained the provisions to which Artis and Ben had agreed. No problem so far. Artis signed the agreement as president of Compco. Okay? And Ben promptly funded the $1 million loan. Under the state law, legal existence of the corporation would begin only when the articles were filed with the Secretary of State. However, through inadvertence, the articles were not filed with the Secretary of State until 10 days after the loan agreement was executed and the loan was funded. So that means that at the time that the loan was funded, and at the time that artist signed as president of Comco, there was no Comco. So who borrowed the money? Ben loaned the million dollars to somebody. Well, ordinarily, uh, a contract which is entered into before the corporation is formed, normally it is the promoters who are liable. But the real rule about that is that it depends on the intent of the parties. When a contract is formed before the corporation comes into existence, and the, uh, the promoter is one part, is uh, making the contract with uh, somebody else, and if for someone else intended to deal only with the corporation when it's formed, then that's who they're dealing with. But if it isn't clear that that person intended to deal only with the corporation and that person would be damaged, then the promoter will be liable. If the person would be damaged if there was no contract at all, for example, if you own an office building and you rent me office space for the corporation to be formed, and I start occupying space before the corporation is formed, then you would be damaged. I'm occupying your space. You must have a contract and agreement with somebody, so it's got to be me, because the corporation does not exist. So. These pre-incorporation agreements like that, where, where the promoter is entering into contracts, is the promoter liable or is only the corporation liable? And the answer is two things. It depends on the intent of the parties. And secondly, the courts will generally protect the innocent party who the promoter is dealing with. Well, here, I think it is fairly clear that Ben did not intend to deal with artists personally. Ben did not intend to loan artists personally one million dollars. Bill Ben intended to deal with the corporation. She signed it as president of the corporation. And he funded the money on that basis. So it's pretty clear that the intent of the parties was that Ben intended to deal with the corporation not with artists as an individual. In addition to that, one can claim if artists have asked to repay the million dollars, artists can say, uh, no, when Ben funded 
the corporation funded the money, the million dollars, that there was a de facto corporation. Not de jure, but de facto. We've studied de facto corporations. A corporation is de facto when, number one, there was, there is, or was a statute under which they could have formed the corporation. Here, obviously, there was such a statute because artists ultimately did form the corporation. So the first requirement that there was a statute under which they could form a corporation is satisfied. Second requirement is that the parties made a good faith effort to comply. On the facts we have here, it's clear that artists made a good faith effort to comply. And finally, the, uh, the need to use some of the corporate power, conduct business in the name of the corporation, issue stock, do something of that sort. And so here, uh, she at least borrowed money. Uh, she borrowed money in the name of the corporation. So I think you have a de facto corporation. So the two arguments as to to whom did Ben loan the money, Ben loaned it to the de facto corporation, or look at the intent of the parties, Ben intended to loan it to the regular corporation, never intended to loan it to artists. Continue. Artist was duly elected as sole officer and director of Comco. Only one officer or director. Hmm. Well, you can do that with a uh, professional corporation where you are a professional and you want to incorporate for certain purposes. You can do that, but this is not a professional corporation. They're going to manufacture stuff, and so we don't really have enough directors. Obviously, we don't have the uh, president, secretary, and treasurer are the three offices that you must have. The uh, secretary and treasurer cannot be the same person. So here we, we, have not, we don't have enough officers yet. We do have a corporation, but we don't have enough officers. Thereafter, the computer device was manufactured and Comco enjoyed some initial business success, but payments on the loan, uh, they made payments on the loan and made the 20% of the net profits to Ben. So they functioned very well as a corporation without having the proper number of, uh, uh, of officers here. The, the, you, you can have, you need, you need three offices filled as to, for the office, president, secretary, and treasurer. And as I was mentioning, the secretary and treasurer cannot be the same person. Uh, but so far we, we'll see what comes of that. It's a background problem that's going on here. Next paragraph. Compico authorized only 1,000 no par common shares for an issue price of one thousand dollars per share. Well, a thousand shares, thousand dollars per share is one million dollars. So that's the money. That's the stock that was um, uh, available to be issued. One thousand shares. Comp issued 200 shares to artists in return for her assignment of all rights in her invention to Comco. Well, that's okay. She can give property in exchange for stock. Remember, if you're issuing stock, you need the person needs to pay for that stock. You don't get stock free. And the, the person paying for the stock, the shareholder, must pay in either money received, money paid, or the corporation. If the corporation is issuing the stock, 
then the corporation must get back either money received, property received, money received, property received, or work performed. That's the common law rule. Modernly, we have deviated from that rule some. If the work has not been performed yet, but there is a contract to perform the work in writing, you can issue stock for work to be performed under those circumstances. Secondly, if you are issuing the stock for property received, you must actually receive the property. And if you issue it for money received, then the money needs to be received. Here, uh, artists gave the corporation the rights to her invention, that's intellectual property, for which she received 200 shares. Now, there's a minor problem here, because how do we know that she didn't overcharge the corporation? These shares are being issued at $1,000 per share. She's getting 200 shares. So that amounts to her getting $200,000 for her intellectual property. Is that a fair price? Well, there's a problem here because she is the only, um, she is the only uh, officer and only director. And so, and she also is the person who owns the stock. So we have no checks and balances here. We're not sure that she has not overcharged. If she were the only shareholder, there would be no real problem. She can overcharge herself as much as she wants. But there are other shareholders. Ben is a shareholder, and Ben gets 200 shares pursuant to the agreement. So, uh, has she charged herself too much? Well, it's a problem. When an officer or director trades with his or her own corporation, because of the potential for overreaching, there's a rule called the FADS, F-A-D-S rule. Under the FADS rule, which is just a made-up mnemonic, the transaction, if you are an officer or a director and you're dealing with your own corporation, the transaction must be F, fair, A, authorized, because, and that means that the transaction needs to be authorized by a disinterested majority of the board and the board must have a quorum in order to do any business so you need a disinterested majority of the quorum. So the transaction must be fair, must be authorized by a disinterested majority of a disinterested quorum. FAD the officer or director who is trading with their own corporation must fully disclose anything that is needed to make the transaction fair must be disclosed. You don't have to disclose your blood type, but you must disclose anything that is needed to make the transaction fair. So F-A-D-A, F-A-D so far, fair, authorized, disclosure, full disclosure, and S. S applies his shareholder approval, but shareholder approval is applied only if you cannot get a uh, disinterested quorum. Often the circumstances are such you cannot get a disinterested quorum. In that case, you need to go to the shareholders to get approval. F-A-D-S. Here, uh, was the transaction fair? Well, we don't know. We don't know what the stock's worth. And there's no one to check on it. And Ben doesn't care. Ben doesn't care because Ben's getting the same number of stocks that Artis is getting. 
an artist is the only director, so the uh, we uh, uh, this transaction is kind of a problem because you don't have a disinterested majority of a disinterested quorum, but there's no one to complain at this time. Ben and Carla, Ben and artists, pardon me, Ben and artists are the only shareholders. They each have an equal number of shares. Ben's comfortable with that. There isn't anybody else to complain. And so 400, 400 of the shares have been issued to artists and Ben with no one to complain, whether it's fair or not. So, there's nothing wrong here because there's no one to complain about. We continue. Comco issued 500 shares to others in return for $1,000 per share. So now Comco has sold this stock to other people. Five and a half million dollars worth of this stock they sold to other people. Uh, now we have a problem because these other people will assume that since Comco uh, sold 200 shares to, or gave 200 shares to artists in, in exchange for her intellectual property, these subsequent purchasers will assume that was a fair transaction. When they look on the book, they'll see the trade was made. They will assume it was a fair transaction. Also, Ben has been issued 200 shares in exchange, apparently, for not charging any interest on his loan. And so, once again, they need to look to see if that was a fair transaction, because there was no one to check on that at the time that it happened. No other shareholders. So, uh, when you make transactions of this sort, like Hardis and Ben did, and then you later sell some stock. These people who later buy the stock, those people um, are going to want to know about the earlier transaction. And in fact, if you do what Artis and Ben did, and you intend to sell stock to other people, then of course you must disclose this to them what happened before they bought their stock, you need to disclose this to them at the time that they buy the stock. So if artists and men were issued their stock with the intent that stock should be sold to others, then uh, the others need to be informed about what happened. Here I think it, the artists and men did get their stock with the intent that others would buy in because they sold, they, they uh, have a thousand shares available to issue. They've only issued 400 shares, 200 to artists and 200 to them. So they must have intended to do something with the other 600 shares. Therefore, when they sold these 500 shares to these other uh, shareholders, they needed to disclose this transaction to them so that they would know what happened and could not buy if they didn't want to buy. Continuing, uh, artists caused the remaining 100 shares, so we have 900 shares issued, don't we? 400 to Ben and artists, 500 to paying shareholders, that's 900 and there's 100 left. Hardis caused the remaining 100 shares to be issued as a gift to her friend Carla. Well, you can't issue stock to anybody for, as a gift. You issue stock uh, as a gift and you can just cancel the stock. You cannot later make the person that you donated the stock to pay for it. You can't give somebody something and the next day say, now pay me for it. But you can, if you give someone stock, you can cancel the stock because they have not paid proper consideration for the stock. So, artists caused the remaining 1,000 shares to be issued as a gift to her friend Carla. 
a business, a busy and successful computer marketing expert in an attempt to induce Carla to provide free marketing advice to Conco, which was facing increasing competition. So Artis gave a hundred shares to Carla in the hope that Carla would provide her free marketing advice. Well, she is, if you treat that as a gift, it can be canceled. If you treat it um, as a trade, uh, she is giving stock, artists is giving stock to Carla in exchange for some hope, there's not a real bargain here, just kind of a hope that Carla will help her out, well that's negligence. Okay, that's a breach of duty of care. So artists either breach their duty of care by exchanging stock for a hope, or she breached her duty of care by donating the stock. Either way, it's a breach of her duty of care. Uh, and artists can be required to pay for that stock, or you can just cancel it in the case of a gift. Just cancel it. So the artist is either going to have to cancel that or get the stock or can cancel the stock or pay for it. Uh, however, continuing to read, after receiving the stock, Carla refused to provide any advice. So you see the breach of duty of care by artists. And as a consequence, artists can either cancel the stock to Carla or pay for it. Recently, Compco has operated at a loss and then has not received any further payments under the loan. First call. Are Compco and or artists liable to bend for the payments due under the loan agreement. Well, we know what happened there. That uh, we think Hardis is not personally liable for the loan agreement because there was never any intent to make her liable. Men intended to deal with the corporation. A second argument is that there was a corporation, namely a de facto corporation, at the time the money was advanced. That takes care of the first call of the question. Second call. Is artist liable to Compco for having issued stock to herself and to Carla? And what's the basis for the liability? Well, uh, is artist liable to Compco for the stock she received? She gave up her intellectual property for 200 shares. So she did part with some consideration. But the problem is the fast problem, uh, but there is no one to object. She was the only officer or director. So there's no one to object, and uh, it's okay at this point. Uh, the uh, the issue stock to herself, it's only when she later begins to issue stock to other people for pay that uh, the other people have a right to challenge whether or not she should have received $200,000 for her intellectual property. Again, the rule is that if artists uh, issued, uh, when, when you're starting up a corporation and you issue stock to yourself and maybe some other people, uh, and everyone agrees on uh, what you're doing. For example, uh, I am going to start a corporation and I'm going to issue myself a million shares of stock in exchange for my cat. And I'm going to issue you a million shares of stock in exchange for your dog. And now my pet corporation has a cat and a dog. Uh, as long as we don't intend to issue stock to anybody else, as crazy as that may seem, it's perfectly okay. But if we intend to issue stock to someone else and do so, that someone else has the right to have knowledge 
of what we just did. So that's what you explain about with Cardiff and Comco. As to Carla, as I mentioned, Carla uh, does not have to pay. This was a gift to Carla. So Carla does not have to pay. But the stock can be canceled or artists can be made to pay for giving away the stock. Artists has clearly breached their duty of care in the way that artists dealt with Carla. So as to part two, uh, artists is uh, liable to Comsico only if she, if she fails to disclose to the subsequent purchasers of stock what she has done, if she failed to disclose that to them, then uh, they can challenge her to determine whether or not that was a proper market value for the stock. But if she did disclose and they want to buy under those circumstances, then that's their business. So Carla, so artists may or may not owe Comfico anything for the 200 shares, depending on uh, whether well, she, the facts don't say that she told the other 500 shareholders what happened. So she did not tell them. They can challenge the, whether or not that was a fair transaction between Hardis and Comco and then and Comco. But now we're just talking about Hardis. So the facts do not say that Hardis told the 500, the purchases of the half a million dollars worth of stock what had happened so they can challenge that and we don't know how that challenge would come out because maybe her invention is worth five hundred or two hundred thousand part three part three is then liable to Comco because he was issued stock in what basis and the answer is he has to pay consideration for stock, but he did not charge any interest on his loan. And that is a form of consideration, loaning money to the corporation, not collecting any interest. He got a bunch of other things in place of the interest, but the stock is part of what he got in place of the interest. And uh, he's also taking a substantial risk. But uh, the uh, Ben is not liable for the stock that was issued to Ben because Ben did part with consideration, part with interest on the money, and um, um, uh, period. Part four, is Carla liable? The answer is no. Carla is a donee. He cannot donate to someone and then make them pay for it thereafter. And that's how you would answer this question. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and with the time that is left, I would like to look at the question from the February 1997 bar. I'm sorry, we have Molly, Ruth, and Dryco is the other question, so I guess we should do that one. February 05, Molly, Ruth, and Dryco. So the assigned questions, Molly, Ruth, and Dryco. Let's go through it together. Molly and Ruth were partners in the operation of a dry cleaning store. No real problem. Oh, by the way, class, there's one point I kept intending to mention and did not mention in the problem with artists and Carla and Ben and Compo, and that is that you were told that this was a closed corporation. So you should, if it's a closed corporation, you tell the bar examiners what the definition of a closed corporation is, and if it's a closed corporation, then 
the uh, the officers, directors, and shareholders not only owe a duty of loyalty and care to the, uh, they owe a duty of loyalty and care to each other and to the corporation. That's not normally true. If you own some stock in IBM, you don't owe IBM any kind of duty. Uh, the officers of IBM and directors do not owe you a duty. They owe their duty to the corporation. But in the case of a closed corporation, that's the case where three people, for example, own the corner gasoline station, and they decide to incorporate it. Well, you can see that the rules that you need to regulate that corporation are a little different from the rules you need to regulate IBM or General Motors. So the corner gasoline station corporation is a closed corporation. It's a small corporation run by the shareholders, no general market for the stock. Uh, the, uh, in a case of a closed corporation, each shareholder owes a duty of loyalty and care to the corporation and to the other shareholders. In this case, uh, uh, artists and then are both uh, shareholders in this closed corporation. And so artists owe a duty of care and duty of loyalty to all the shareholders as well as the corporation. So those 500 shareholders who bought into the corporation, she owes them a duty of loyalty and care. And under that rule, you can point out that she would be required uh, under that rule, even if you didn't have any other rule, she would be required, in all fairness, to disclose to these new shareholders the transactions that had gone on before they became shareholders. Getting back to Molly Ruth and Dryco, the question from February 05. Molly and Ruth were partners in the operation of a dry cleaning store. Recent government environmental regulations relating to dangers posed by dry cleaning fluids increased their exposure to liability and caused a decline in their business. So let's be sure we got this right. They own a dry cleaning business. They are partners and they are uh, having problems because of the new stringent regulations on cleaning fluids and is causing a decline in their business. Molly and Ruth decided to convert their partnership, Dryco, to a corporation to limit their potential personal liability. Well, that's okay. They can incorporate if they want to. This is all background so far. Molly and Ruth each contributed $20,000 in cash to Dryco. Okay, that's seems reasonable. Each of them put up 20000 so you have $40,000 cash for the corporation. Now, this corporation might be severely undercapitalized. I don't know yet. If you're trying to start an automobile manufacturing company with $40,000 cash, you obviously are severely undercapitalized, in which case you might be able to pierce the corporate veil and get to, their per get to them personally if they're severely undercapitalized and that causes a problem. But let's keep reading. Molly and Ruth each contributed 20000 and makes 40. In return, each received a $15,000 note from Dryco and 5,000 shares uh, of stock with a value of $1 per share. So they put in $20,000, but they put it in in a funny form. They each put in $20,000, and they, got, they put in $5,000 investment in stock and a $15,000 loan to the corporation. 
so may each have promissory notes. So now the corporation may be severely undercapitalized because they only put up $5,000 each. Next, prior to incorporation, Molly entered into a contract. This is before incorporation, now pre-incorporation. Molly entered into a contract on behalf of Dryco. Well, you know, you really can't contract on behalf of a non-existing corporation. So let's keep going. It looks like Molly is going to be liable so far, unless the other party really did not intend to deal with her. But let's go on. Molly entered into a contract on behalf of Dryco with Equipment Company for the unsecured credit purchase of an environmentally safe dryer for $100,000. EC was aware that Dryco had not yet been formed. So it looks like Molly is going to be liable on this debt because she incurred the debt before the corporation was formed. Even if the corporation gets formed and adopts the contract, she remains secondarily liable. So let's continue. Uh, equipment company delivered the dryer one week after the incorporation. Well, they didn't know when the incorporation happened. And Dryco used it thereafter and made monthly installment payments. Well, it's clear that Dryco adopted the contract because if you know about it, because the corporation knows about a contract and accepts the benefits, then they are adopting the contract. So Dryco has adopted the contract. That makes Dryco liable. But Molly is also liable because she's also liable because she was the promoter who formed this contract. Uh, next paragraph. Draco had been incorporated in compliance with all statutory requirements. And Molly and Ruth observed all corporate formalities during the period of Draco's existence. So the bar examiners are telling you that you're not going to be able to pierce the corporate veil on the theory that the parties did not maintain formalities, that is, keeping the corporate business and bank accounts, etc., separate from their own personal bank accounts, etc. And so you will not be able to pierce the corporate veil based on uh, the, the absence of those formalities. But we still do have the undercapitalization possibility. Let's keep going. One year after incorporation, however, Dryco became insolvent and dissolved. So now you can see what's coming. Equipment company wants to be paid. Dryco has no the money. They want to go after Molly, and they probably can. They can go after Molly on the, gr on the ground that she was a promoter and entered into the contract with them. They also might go after both after Ruth and Molly together on the grounds that the corporation was undercapitalized. But I don't know if that would work. After all, the corporation did last for a year, did function for a year, and so was it severely undercapitalized? I don't know. Continuing. At the time of dissolution, Draco's assets were valued at $50,000. Well, that $50,000 needs to go to pay Equipment Corporation because when a corporation uh, dissolves, equi uh, Equipment Company is a creditor. And when the corporation dissolves, you take all the assets and pay off all the creditors first, and then the shareholders can have what's left. One problem here, of course, is that Ruth and uh, Molly are both going to say, well, we are creditors also. We uh, loaned the corporation $15,000 each. And so we should send 
in the same line as equipment company, and you pay each of us pro rata, you know, in proportion to what we're owed. Uh, Trico, the, uh, I don't know how much was still owed on the loan, on the, on the purchase of the dry cleaning equipment, and so the purchaser of the dry cleaning equipment, the seller of the dry cleaning equipment says, we want to be paid, and Ruth wants to be paid, and Molly wants to be paid, all of them as creditors of the corporation. But you can see how the equipment company is a different kind of creditor than Ruth and Molly are. Ruth and Molly are creditors who put up money to help get the corporation going, and they should have put that up really as, uh, as investment. Instead, they loaned that money to the corporation. But that money was really operating money. That money was really, should have been there as a, uh, as an investment. So we have a rule called the Deep Rock Doctrine. The Deep Rock Doctrine says when uh, uh, a creditor is also one of the owners, and particularly if they're an owner and manager of the corporation, and they also loan the corporation money, that that creditor does not stand in the same shoes as an outsider who loaned the money at arm's length. It's called the deep rock doctrine, not because, not because it's a deep pocket or anything, because the case came from a cement company called the deep rock company. It's called the deep rock doctrine. And so Molly and Ruth do not stand in the same position as equipment company. Equipment company should be paid first, and you explain the deep rock doctrine, you explain that Molly and Ruth are the owners, they uh, uh, operated the business, and they loaned money to the business. And when people are in that position, they are generally not treated on the same status, same uh, standing as outside creditors. And based on that theory, uh, the uh, equipment company ought to be paid first. Secondly, the corporation is, uh, owes the rest of the money to the equipment company if they can't, they don't have enough. But if the corporation has no money, and they don't, then the question obviously is going to be, can the equipment company go against Molly because she's a promoter? And can they go against both of them because the corporation was undercapitalized? Those are the issues that you're obviously going to have to discuss. Can equipment company go after Molly and Ruth based on an undercapitalization theory, piercing the corporate veil? And can they go after, and the deep rock doctrine is the other issue. And the uh, third issue is, can they go after Molly as a promoter? Once again, can the equipment company go after Molly as a promoter? Can they go after both of them and because the corporation is undercapitalized and you pierce the corporate veil? And thirdly, can they go after uh, our, our Molly and Ruth or the deep rock doctrine? They should not be paid on the same standing as the equipment company. So let's keep reading. Continuing to read, it says, at the time of dissolution, Draco's assets were valued at 50000 Its debt totaled 120000 consisting of the two $15,000 notes held by Molly and Ruth. Well, that's 40000 and they're not going to get that back, really. And the $90,000 balance owed to EC. So EC is entitled to all of the 50000 but EC is also owed another 40000 And they will go after Ruth and Molly by trying to pierce the corporate veil, and they'll go after Molly on a promoter's liability theory. Let's read the cause of the question. One, as among EC, Molly, and Ruth, how should the 50000 assets be distributed? Answer, give it all to EC, the equipment company. Number two, on what theories, if any, can Molly and or Ruth 
be held liable for the balance owed to EC. And we just talked about that, either piercing the corporate veil or the deep rock doctrine. I'm pardon me, either piercing the corporate veil or the fact that Molly is a promoter and uh, she entered into this contract before the corporation was formed. And that's the end of the analysis of that question, and that's the end of tonight's or today's class. We're open to questions now, questions and answers. Uh, please send them in. We'll be glad to deal with them.